Welcome back to Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Frezza. For the second half of our show, we're pleased to have family farmer Martha Bonita here to share her story, perhaps similar to something that's played out in microcosm in your town, if you've ever known anyone who's had a run-in with overbearing local regulators. Martha, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I've been looking forward to it. My producer brought you to my attention. There's a lot of press on you, but I understand that in 2006, you bought a farm. Correct, and it was my childhood dream. It's located in beautiful Fauquier County, Virginia, in a little village called Paris. Uh, it's so small that there are more cows than there are actual residents. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we're, we have about 60 residents. And it's, it's a picturesque, beautiful, rural agricultural community in Virginia. It's about 50 minutes to 55 minutes away from the White House. Oh, that's not far. So we we're still in northern Virginia, but very rural and bucolic, and it's a farming community. And we're talking 50, 60 acres here. We're not talking about... Uh, right. Okay. Correct. It's 64 acres, which is a small, considered a small family farm. Mm -hmm. We're surrounded by thousands of acres of farmland. And really, it was my childhood dream. I grew up in Mount Vernon on what was a part of George Washington's vast farmland, in particular his uh, pig farm. And uh, my mom always had these kitchen gardens in the backyard, mm -hmm. and uh, I loved them. And it, that's where my childhood dream really grew. My mom would always say the vegetables tasted so good <laughs> because of George Washington's pigs. And do you run a do you run a business off this? Do you make a living off this farm? Well, we uh, we started farming it. We, there was a lot of work that we had to do to get the farm up and running to create mm -hmm. the infrastructure for farming. And we started farming it. You know, sometime after purchasing it, after we had put in the wells and the mm -hmm. fencing and so forth, and uh, we produce eggs, organic vegetables. Mm -hmm. We have an apiary. We produce raw honey, herbs, mm -hmm. and uh, about a thousand round bales of hay, and they weigh about eight hundred pounds apiece. And what had happened? I had opened up a little farm store in my barn, where on the weekends it was about seven hours a week. Because during the week, uh, it doesn't make sense really to be open because mm -hmm. most of the the business on the farm comes from people from closer to the city, closer to Washington D.C., coming out to the country to pick your own orchards mm -hmm. and farms to pick up their eggs and fresh vegetables. A little bucolic weekend. Let's get, let's pick up some watermelons exactly. over on the road. Yeah, Exactly. And, and we're located uh, around a lot of Virginia wineries. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot of families would come out, there, maybe some couples, they'd stop at a winery, they'd buy their um, vegetables and their honey and their uh, eggs, and, uh, and it would be a wonderful uh, weekend trip away from the city. No bed and breakfast yet. No, there is one right down the road. <laughs> okay, okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah. why are we reading about you in the newspaper? What, what well, happened? Well, you know, I was, I was living my childhood dream, and I grew up in a family where my parents said, they, I'm the youngest of three girls, if you work really hard and you're dedicated, you can be anything you want in life. I mean, we were taught that there's, there were no limits as long as we were willing to work hard and mm -hmm. put our heart into it. And this is something I really wanted to do. And so my dream became reality. I started farming, and one of my dear friends, her daughter uh, was turning, her daughter was turning 10 years old. Mm -hmm. And we had eight of her 10-year-old friends at the farm for a birthday party in January. We should do this for the kids all the time at home. Exactly. It's as American as apple pie. <laughs> and, you know, you would think that having children come to a small family farm would be something that would be celebrated and encouraged, particularly in a rural agricultural county. And the next thing I knew, my zoning administrator in my county had gone on my personal Facebook page and had seen pictures of eight 10-year-old little girls celebrating a birthday. Now, let me tell you right now, there were no tents or clowns or magicians or anything like that. It was all in the barn. We had cake. We collected eggs. We played with baby lamb and, and uh, baby sheep and goats. And it was a wholesome, all-American birthday party for eight 10-year-old little girls in the middle of January. Up on Facebook. Up on Facebook. It was a friend's daughter that, that wanted to have her birthday party at the farm. And the next thing I know, I receive a violation notice from my county saying that I had violated the county ordinance, that I had to have a site plan, a special exception permit, and an administrative permit, and threatening me with up to $15,000 a day. Now, wait a minute. You, you're not running 10 of these a day? There's not no, lines of cars actually, out in front was, of your no, house? No, no, heavens no. no you're not no, no, advertising no, no, no. birthday party no. services in the local newspaper? No, absolutely not, no. And I, I've never personally advertised for the farm as as a as a venue, and to have this uh, 
happen is devastating. And what they did was, simultaneously, they also shut me down from being able to sell what I produce on the land. Which you've been doing all along. Which I've been doing all along. And do you have a license had, for that? I had a business license from Fauquier County. Huh. And uh, here I am. I went to the trouble of you know registering my farm with the county. I paid a fee to do that. Mm-hmm. I listed everything I was doing. And I also received a business license that specifically said farm store and listed all of the activities and everything we were doing on the farm. So you can imagine how um, devastating it is. I was in full-on harvest when this happened. And I had to quickly move all of my vegetables and produce. A good majority of them ended up getting donated to local food banks because um, we did gleaning, which is harvesting vegetables and giving them Mm -hmm. through the churches to people that are in need. And I was stunned. It was devastating. I couldn't imagine that in America this could possibly happen. Now, did you have to lawyer up at this point to go fight this? And what's the process? Well, the the process is is a tedious one. First of all, you're given the opportunity to appeal the zoning administrator's decision. And keep in mind, I had a business license, Mm -hmm. and the zoning administrator had never been to my farm. This was just based strictly on, you know... uh, A Facebook picture. Troll, I mean, why were they looking at my Facebook page? <laughs> I mean, that's the question, right? Hmm. I mean, there are, I don't know exactly how many citizens there are in Fauquier County, but I can't imagine it would take an extraordinary amount of time to look at thousands and thousands of citizens' Facebook pages. Did you tick off a neighbor and they're just setting the authorities on you because out of spite? Well, that, that seems to be the theme. Really? That, yeah, and, but, but I can tell you that Really, at the end of the day, the burden is on the county. And when a county issues something like this on a 64-acre farm zoned rural agricultural in an agricultural county, in an agricultural district in a right-to-farm state, it's the burden is on them to prove what was done wrong because Virginia is such a beautiful agricultural commonwealth with a long history of farming and agriculture that by law, by right, by the Virginia statute, if you're a farm and you're zone rural agricultural, it runs with the land that you can sell what you produce on your land. We are surrounded by laws and regulations, but someone we has are. to have a beef. Someone has to have a beef and set these authorities upon you. Who has the beef? Who's pulling the strings? That's an excellent question. And uh, we are in the middle of litigation right now. We're in the process of going through discovery and the Freedom of Information Act and so forth. I can tell you that We've had tremendous support from all across the Commonwealth and across the nation. The Institute for Justice wrote letters, the Rutherford Institute, Mm. property rights organizations from across the nation. Because really, at the end of the day, what is this about? Well, it's also about economic freedom and economic liberty, the ability to work hard and, and have the opportunity to achieve success in your chosen field, as well as a property rights issue. So what happened, it created a, 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 a statewide conversation, a national conversation. Thousands of Virginians rallied together. People came and protested in my county. I mean, I see that. It's all over the, I have Googling around, it's all over the press. And there seems to be a group called the Piedmont Environmental Council who's been elevated as the, as the boogeyman in this. What role do they play in the zoning board? The Piedmont Environmental Council is an environmental group mm-hmm. closely affiliated with the county. Mm-hmm. And the Piedmont Environmental Council uh, has easements on various properties mm-hmm. together with, in some instances, the Virginia Outdoors Foundation. So this, this is just a slow development so that you don't sell your house, your, your property to a condo developer. Exactly. And, and I believe, and I, I could be corrected, but I believe around 35% of Fauquier County is in perpetual conservation mm-hmm. easements. And I think that the reason why this became such a, such a national conversation and dialogue is because we're losing our small family farmers at an epic rate, not only in Virginia, but across the country. And, you know, large agriculture is, you know, we need to feed, we need to feed the nation. We need to um, feed Americans. But our traditional small family farmers are, we're losing them. And part of it is attributed to extraordinary amounts of regulation, miles and miles of red tape that I never dreamed in a million years uh, my family or I would encounter. Uh, so the big farmers, they can afford to allocate resources to, to all those regulations because they've got hundreds or thousands of acres under, under cultivation. But sure. it's tough to pay for that when you've got 67, 68 acres. Well, indeed. But it, 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 and, 
and really, you know, at the end of the day, we should be supporting and encouraging uh, agriculture and small producers that are really, you know, such an integral part of our history, particularly in Virginia. Well, that's up to your customers. I mean, if your customers want to buy your, your fruit, sure. let, God bless Absolutely. them, right? I mean, God bless them, right. And, <laughs> that's who and, should and, make and, the decision, not a regulator. Absolutely. I'm with you 100%. And we're not saying, you know, large producers shouldn't exist. In fact, you know, I, I'm You don't starve the, without large producers. I, so, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, I'm all for the free market. I think the larger farming uh, industry should be as successful and as large as, as they can be. And small family farmers should also have the opportunity to be competitive in the small family farm local niche, and they can coexist together. Were they concerned that because you had a birthday party in your barn, you're going to start running circuses or something and create congestion and, and an eyesore? Oh, it, and it, it, it's, so, it's so extraordinary. Um, throughout this process, one of our county elected officials said that you know birthday parties would lead to junkyards. Now, <laughs> I don't know how you can draw that correlation wow. between eight, okay. ten-year-old little girls having cake and playing with baby lamb and collecting eggs uh, would lead to uh, junkyards. junkyards. But those are some of the outrageous statements that have been made. Another uh, legislator uh, had said that, uh, you know, if, if the bill, and we can talk about the bill that became law, yeah, I'd like became to. law, you know, there'd be strip clubs and chicken coops throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia. Obviously <laughs> ridiculous, right? <laughs> Well, see, Ridiculous. I, one way to pass a law is to raise fears. But before we get on to the but ba- yeah. ba- bill, I understand halfway through this, you suddenly got audited by the IRS. Yes, that's correct. And actually, it was around the same time. Yeah. It was within, uh, within several weeks. Several weeks? Had you been audited before? I, I, I think it was, it was between uh, six to eight weeks. Huh. Mm-hmm. Had you been audited before, or was this your first audit? Uh, this was the first audit you know this was this was a massive audit Mm -hmm. and it was the first of its kind i had ever witnessed and what and and, what made it unique in my situation was that an elected official in my county was aware of the audit and had disclosed it to others before my family or i had even received the audit itself how is that possible that's an excellent question and one that uh is being investigated it is who's who's doing the investigating well, that's being researched in many different ways. There is an IG investigator mm-hmm. that is uh, that has looked into the situation. So, um, who is it that proposed legislation to keep this from happening? As you know, it created a, a massive statewide conversation, and it started off as uh, farmers and consumers too mm-hmm. that wanted to have access to the farms, and then it grew larger and it became a property rights issue and an economic liberty issue and a prosperity issue. Hmm. And thousands of Virginians came together on a bipartisan basis. And letters were written. Thousands of petitions were signed. Phone calls. Uh, <laughs> petitions. I mean, uh, it became protests in, in Richmond, our state capital. And, you know, I went from talking to the farm animals and engaging the farm animals to uh, literally becoming a part of a much larger <laughs> You're a poster child now. And who's on the opposite side of this? I mean, so you got a bunch of people who want to buy your vegetables. Who's running the counter-protests? Well, I can tell you that I can't imagine why anybody wouldn't want to do everything possible to support our small family farmers. We, you know, we hear a lot about jobs, 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 and, you know, creating jobs and opportunities for Americans. And what could be more all-American than small family farmers working the land, harvesting the fruit of their labor, and selling it directly to the consumer? I can't imagine why anybody would be against it. Uh, however, we did run into a lot of opposition from a, a group that you did mention already in this conversation, mm-hmm. as well as local county governments hmm. were concerned. And the unique part about this legislation, and I want to make this clear, is that the land has to be zoned rural agricultural, and that's really key here because the idea is not to have farms popping up in city centers so that you don't have row homes or townhomes mm, with, chicken with, poops. with yeah with chickens and goats and sheep and cows in the backyard. <laughs> you know that's not the intention. The intention is if you're a small family farmer and you're on land zoned rural agricultural and you're farming, that the local county governments can't come in and expose you to unreasonable regulations, burden you with miles and miles of restrictions and permitting and fees and so forth that really are driving the small family farmer into extinction. Uh, So this is a state preemption of county power. 
Yes, exactly. And the beautiful part of it is that the benefit to the Commonwealth at large is truly untold at this point. But what it does is it, it provides an opportunity to really be viable on the land without the threat of or the fear. It's really being able to farm farm without fear of when the county will come in and, you know, shut you down like they did to me. Because if it could happen to me, it can happen to anybody. So the headline reads that the 2014 Bonetta bill passed the House and Senate. You got a bill named after yourself without being kidnapped. So that's an accomplishment. <laughs> yes. And it's a real honor and a privilege to have been able to meet so many incredible Virginians and legislators across Virginia. Uh, it is. It became a bipartisan movement. And it is something that I never dreamed in a million years I would be a, I would be a part of. But <laughs> I have to say that it's been a pleasure to be able to work through the process and have such a, an incredible bill that helps so many people, so many farmers, and also consumers have access be, become law. And I'm very grateful for everybody that worked so hard to make it happen. Now, is this going to preempt the rulings that have been made against you? What happens to litigation? I and mean, what happens to you next? That's an excellent question. And because I am in litigation, I, I am working through that process right now. Mm -hmm. And I hope to have some answers fairly soon. Right now, I'm really busy on the farm. It's our busy season. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the fruit trees are popping with fruit. The vegetables are exploding out of the earth. And we just tapped the hives not too long ago with uh, raw, fresh local honey. And the eggs are fantastic. And we're just really excited to have our doors open and to be welcoming the, the public to our farm. And so you are able to sell again d d in this period. You're not yes. under a, a, a cloud Absolutely right now. Absolutely correct, yes. So you started out as a, f a small farmer. You became a little bit of a, of a media celebrity, and now you find yourself a community organizer. You've probably learned a lot about bringing people together. What are the, what's the wider implications of this? Well, I think that ultimately it demonstrates how when, you know, the will of the grassroots and how when we work together, how we really can move mountains and we really can make a difference and how together by really being tenacious and not giving up because as you know the bill had failed the first time mm. it passed the house and then it failed on the senate ag committee subcommittee floor and it took a year of working together bringing people together from from all sides of the issues and and having everybody come together and sit together at the table and to hammer out legislation that's a compromise. And by compromising, I don't mean giving up on values. I mean what we came up with is an opportunity to build from. And it's been an incredible blessing. I'm grateful beyond words. And it, it just it proves that one person or a group of people can really create a, a movement and can really uh, create and change laws that are that are better for everyone. And uh, like I said, it's it's just been an incredible opportunity to to work with some wonderful people from the legislators that introduced the legislation to um, the countless uh, other individuals from various groups from all over the spectrum that, that have really come together <laughs> and rallied and were unshakable. You've been quite dedication. a lightning rod. Any plans to run for the zoning board? <laughs> I, I hear that. All, I've asked that <laughs> all the time. But, you know, this, this really is a story about, you know, the American dream. I mean, I, this is something I wanted to do my whole life. You want to go back to picking vegetables. You don't want to run for office. You know, I, I really, you know, this is what I wanted. This was my dream. And, you know, I was so shattered to think that, you know, there were, there were miles and miles of regulations and obstacles in my path. And it really made me profoundly passionate to make sure that what happened to me wouldn't happen to anybody else. I didn't want any other family to have to suffer the way we did. So for me... You know, it's it's just been a real blessing. I'm excited to be at the farm. Uh, it's been wonderful to have people come from all over the state to stop in and uh, congratulate us and, 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 you know, enjoy the farm and enjoy what we produce. And, you know, that's really my passion and where my heart is. Well, Mar Martha, thanks for being on the show. Good luck with uh, all Thank of this. Thank you. I hope you can go back to uh, more idyllic times and stop yes. spending time with lawyers and media people. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. Take care. That was Martha Benita back picking vegetables in Paris, Virginia, wrapping up this week's show on Real Clear Radio Hour brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Frezza. You can download all our past programs from www.realclearradio.org or tune in each week, same time, same station, here on Bloomberg Boston and WROM Detroit. See you next week. <laughs>